And we are excited to have Mr. Tim McDonald back with us today. Um, I am gonna do a brief introduction, but I saw his next slide and it's a way better introduction. <laughs> Tim McDonald is a seasoned Smith County detective. He has a history of interviewing suspects and working criminal cases involving children. Tim McDonald also started Aspis Consulting Inc. Did I say that right? Perfect. Okay. A nonprofit that helps parents keep their children safe on the internet. We all know how important that is. Um, today, Tim is going to be talking to us about um, drug addiction and the growing epidemic across the United States. Um, this class will help you better understand addiction, recognize habits of addicts, signs of narcotics abuse, and help you identify drug paraphernalia. Having the ability to recognize indicators of narcotics abuse can potentially save a child's life. So, Mr. Tim, thank you so much for being here. It is really a treat for us to have you. And we are going to get started. Well, we'll see about the treat part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you know what you're doing. Jeez, so. I, remember, I remember last time I broke something and, <laughs> and I think you had to come up and fix it like a couple of times. You're like, you would just stop doing that. I mean, well, Jared's here to help us well, out. Well, I'm so glad to be here. It's, it's an honor to uh, be asked to come here. Um, uh, some of you have heard me uh, before and uh, I think, I don't know if I was medicated that day, but I'm proud to say that I am and I should be able to start focusing here before you can. Um, I've been in law enforcement for over for a ride of about 17 years. Two of that was volunteer, uh, and then I got hooked on the uh, police work, and then actually went to police academy and became a, a certified peace officer. For, so for the last 17 years, I've been in this world where uh, people do things that are uh, against the law. Uh, one of the most common that we uh, see uh, on a on a daily basis is narcotics abuse. And uh, uh, part of that is, is narcotics abuse, Some uh, for uh, the most part, can be the foundational reason why things continue into other criminal activity and stuff. But um, this, what we're going to talk about today in an hour and 15 minutes or so, so we can have some uh, time for any questions you may have at the end. Uh, this is from a 40-hour course that we teach on narcotics. Um, and so what you're going to see is highlights of a, a much bigger picture uh, that I don't think we can get away with a 40 hour lunch break. That would be awesome. But uh, so what I did is uh, I, I took just the, uh, the highlights. Uh, we'll briefly talk about uh, uh, how it affects uh, people and, uh, and I generalized it to, yeah, we take care of children, we advocate for children and uh, all the things, but it doesn't just have to be children. I mean, it's the same for teens, preteen adults and so on. So I generalized a lot of things so we can take the concepts more than just, oh, it's this, this, this. How many of you were at the uh, neuro-linguistics uh, training that I taught okay. about a few years ago? Has it been a couple of years? Uh, and, and, I, and it was one of the things I said, it's not just if they do this one thing, it, then they're lying. It was, a, it was a combination of several things. I'm going to take that approach with this. Of, uh, when I start showing you what narcotics look like, if you don't uh, believe it or not, there's people that, that don't know what drugs look like. Paraphernalia. That, is, that was on every spelling test in the police academy. Paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. the fun word to spell. Right up there with lieutenant. Go, go ahead and try to spell that one. I don't, I don't, it's LT period. <laughs> Para period. Done. But uh, And that's what we're going to try to do. But... Uh, I've already broken something. <laughs> already, dang. <laughs> Almost. I was going to say, maybe if you point at something. Oh, here we go. Jared, you have your I can just do this. <laughs> yeah, our point just kind of has its own. It does what it wants. Go to Parks and Recreation. I'll try clicking it and seeing if it. Oh, there you go. All right, perfect, perfect. Um, I, I don't know if you know that guy on the screen right there, but it's me. Uh, I tried to wear a tie today because I, I wanted to be impressive. But um, here's a little bit about me. This is not so you can pat me on the back and tell, tell me how awesome I am. This is just simply so you know that Mary Jo didn't just scrape me up off the side of the street to fill up an hour and a half of time. 
so everybody can get some CT hours. Now, um, like I said, I've been uh, doing the uh, in law enforcement for about 17 years. I hold a master peace officer certification, all those things, instructor, armor. They let me tinker with firearms. I get to teach them how to shoot them, and I get to shoot them, and then I get to play with them and take them apart and put them back together. It's it's, it's one of my favorites. But um, I do a lot. Of, I spend a lot of time instructing. Uh, after uh, 17 years of being in this, it's uh, – uh, a lot of the guys that have been around that long, we tended to go into a more of an instructor role, and uh, and I'm okay with that. I've got uh, my associate's degree from Jacksonville College, uh, bachelor from Dallas Baptist uh, University, and go Patriots. Uh, my master of public ad, uh, administration from UT Tyler. Uh, just if you're wondering, it's of the best school ever. Go Patriots! I'm just saying, throwing it out there. But I went to a police academy uh, at Kilgore College, and just to bother Mary Jo, I play lead guitar for mental custody. Uh, <laughs> Stop. Are you saying? No. Uh, but um, again, after years of seeing uh, narcotics use in homes, narcotics use in business, narcotics use in people with people that you would never uh, suspect doing anything wrong. Um, I realized how widespread it is and how much of uh, a problem it, it's going to continue to be. Um, when we have enough information, where we know that which direction drugs travel on the interstates and which way the money travels back. There's a lot, a lot of people spend a lot of time and research into uh, narcotics abuse and how it can affect uh, families and whatnot. Um, what we're going to uh, briefly talk about uh, over the next hour and 15 minutes, or probably hour and 10 minutes now, is uh, just uh, just general definition of what addiction is. And it kind of can open people's eyes to it being more than just, well, they just should just stop. Uh, well, you, you do dope? Well, you quit. No, it's, it's a little more complex than that. Uh, we'll talk about some uh, common behaviors uh, for addicts and signs of narcotics abuse. And also, uh, we will show you a lot of pictures of uh, drug paraphernalia and actual narcotics. So uh, it, it may be helpful if, if some of you are ever in a room uh, or at a home and you start seeing two or three or four or five of these things that we're going to go. It's just like the neurolinguistics, those indicators. If you see one, it, it, it's not necessarily something that you can go, oh, yeah, they're definitely, they're, they're, they're meth monkeys, I know, because oh. I, I saw one thing. Now, when you start seeing a pattern a cluster of these things, then you could start thinking about, oh, I probably need to step out, leave, and go call somebody. So that's where we're going to go, and then we'll end with some uh, final takeaways and questions. Any Anybody opposed? Going once, going twice. Okay, here we go. All right. I looked up two di uh, dictionaries. I would have done three, but for some reason, uh, one of them didn't work. So we got two definitions with uh, uh, this. Uh, basically, com uh, so a compulsive, chronic, psychological, or physiological need for habit-forming substances, behaviors, or activities. So addiction doesn't necessarily mean substance, but that's where we're going to focus today. Drugs. Doing the drugs. Uh, or a strong inclination to do, use, or indulge in something repeatedly. Okay. Uh, there is, in both of these, uh, we see um, that it is a very powerful drive. It is a very powerful hold. It is a compulsive. If anybody knows about compulsivity, I have a very compulsive eight-year-old, and, and you say, hey, they stop tapping the drumstick on the table, and, 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 and it took us a while to realize he can't help it. He is... He is um, Asperger's, and he, dude is smarter than me and my wife put together, but part of his um, issues, compulsivity, you can tell him, don't do it. And he's trying so hard not to. Did you have to get that out? It's okay, buddy. I get it. And so when we start talking about drug addiction, it's not as simple as, like I said, hey, would you should just stop smoking weed. Okay, you can train people to you can teach your kids. I like let's not do this. Hey, but if they ever do, and that addiction sets in, you flip a switch that is very difficult, and sometimes for some impossible to flip off. Don't flip anybody off. <laughs> that's one. You know what I mean. And so it and it takes, and that's why they say once you're an addict, you're always an addict. It's just whether or not you can have the self learn the coping mechanisms 
of self-control. So when we are dealing with families of addiction or people that appear to be normal, and then you're like, oh, addiction, we can show a little bit of grace and mercy because it's a little stronger, it's a little more than just they should just stop that. All right. All right. Behaviors. We discussed a lot about the body language last time. There are very uh, common indicators in body language and behaviors for narcotics use. Okay. Um, now, uh, some of them may not be on this list. This may be a drop in the bucket to things that people with uh, narcotics abuse or addiction display. But these are some of the most common ones. Uh, dishonesty and manipulation. You ever heard of a, a from a friend or some a family member that so and so's uh, nephew is strung out on the crack and uh, and just went in there and just stole everything they had and sold it all for drugs. Okay, uh, manipulation. Uh, there there tends to be a uh, a, a it's not a desire it's a it's a coping uh, a basically a response to having to try to find certain ways to get money or drugs and stuff. They'll manipulate people will manipulate the ones they love. Oh, you would never do that. Grandma can have a hundred dollars. I'm gonna go help uh, feed the poor. <laughs> Bless your heart. Take two hundred cash or whatever. You know, I know that's a little dramatic, but uh, manipulation is uh, very, very common. Hey, I'm going to go back to that. I'm not done with that. Shifting of blame. Uh, they can never do anything wrong. It wasn't their fault. Oh, this, uh, if, if it wasn't for me breaking my leg and when I was bull riding or whatever people do, to, uh, I would have never got hooked on these pills. Or I, well, if I hadn't, if you hadn't made me go to that school, I would have never got friend, become friends with Johnny and, and, and I would have never started smoking weed. And then I would not have started smoking a cracker and then all heroin and then do it. It's never their fault. The, the, the blame shift is a very common drastic mood swings. If you've got uh, somebody that's on a narcotic that turns off, they take it, they're high, and then all of a sudden it's gone, they can fly off the handle or they can go from way happy, Tim, to depressed or low. And then it, it can go back and forth within minutes or seconds even. Um, sorry, when I talk, I have to refuel. Um, we talked a little bit about impulsivity. But the uh, there is a a direct correlation to narcotics use, <laughs> brain function, and, and mental health, and things like that. So if I'm going to show you a list, a few of the things where I drew some, we drew some of this uh, information from later. But there's empirical research data that can show has been shown for a hundred years the direct correlation of Mental health, mental illness, and narcotics use. One can can exacerbate the other. If there's mental issues and you take a lot of drugs, guess what? That's going to make you spiral a lot harder and a lot faster with mental health. And if you have mental health issues, what do people try to do when they have mental health issues? They try to self-medicate, right? And so when you self-medicate, then you well, it's not. You get that high, and then you're like, "I feel great. I'm, all, all things are great. I don't, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm uh, depressed. I don't feel like I'm uh, three p different people. I don't, or whatever the case may be with mental, whatever mental health they're struggling with. All of a sudden, they feel good, and then the next time they take the same amount of narcotics or whatever they're using, alcohol or smoking weed, whatever to self-regulate, and it's just not as good as it was, or not as powerful as it was the time before, because we build resistance, and so one. Makes the others each other, they make each other just spiral out of control all the all the more. So we have to we have to be mindful of that. And so impulsivity is one of the things that you may be able to recognize when somebody's trying to keep it all in and not let on that they're under the influence or uh, have been under the influence of narcotics. But impulsivity is a drop in the bucket of different things and mannerisms and uh, things that uh, ticks or things like that. Subconscious, uncontrollable, they just happen to book. Okay. Um, you may have seen videos of people that 
get high, they get paranoid. A lot of people get paranoid. A lot of people don't. But she walked in the room, I'm like, <laughs> or all of a sudden, Casa's advocates show up to that Casa or whatever you have to tell them or whatever you think of, and I was like, <laughs> she's going to know. Oh, gee. So now, yes. Paranoia, anxiety. Uh, it, it it runs hand in hand with narcotics use. Partially because it's illegal, partially because, well, people don't want to get caught. We talked about that and uh, about the deception, or how why people choose to deceive and do all that when we uh, had the last class that I was here when we talked about neurolinguistics. But um, these are just some things that are common. Criminal activity will uh, elicit use of narcotics and drugs is illegal. So, yeah, but we talked about stealing. Uh, there is uh, one of the uh, papers that I've got uh, uh, listed in one of my, the slides when we talk about the empirical research as how uh, it affects assaultive, how narcotics, there's an increase of assaultive type crimes. Uh, there's a, a, and that can be, and I saw that a lot with child abuse when I was working child crimes. Uh, a lot of the families that I dealt with, guess what? Yeah, you guessed it. They used narcotics. They were they were addicts. A lot of them um, are not, but there is a direct correlation and a uh, and research that shows that assaultive offenses and narcotics they they will spiral together and they will increase together. So, um, suicidal tendencies. One of the other uh, 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 papers that I have uh, uh, listed and. Uh, it, there is almost, whether it be just the tendency or the ideation of suicidal thoughts or the actual attempting or successfully carrying out suicide, it is a, there is a direct correlation to those that use narcotics. Okay. Why do people use narcotics anyways? Sometimes it's just fun. Sometimes it's just the recreational, but addicts, a lot of times it's because they were trying to fix something in themselves that they couldn't fix any other way. And so when that is the source of the narcotics use, you can see how, well, it's not permanent, it's temporary. And so they, it just turns into a vicious cycle and they just, I'm never gonna be able to get, make it, I'm never gonna be able to do it, I'm never gonna be able to fix this, I'm never gonna be a good person, I'm never, and then you know, so on and so forth. You can think of a million different scenarios, but you can see how, once somebody starts going to jail over and over again, they're losing all their friends. They're losing all their family members. They're losing everything they had. There's a hundred different reasons why suicidal tendencies and even suicidal acts take place and are directly correlated to the narcotics use. Okay? Um, with common behaviors, I'd encourage you to start digging into uh, researching those things because everybody's different. Okay. I'm, I may, I, I'm, I'm the least experienced with narcotics because I've never used an illegal, illegal substance in my life. Uh, I, I haven't. And I, so I, I know there are videos you can watch and watch people's interviews, how they struggle and how, you know, the, the all of these things were manifested in their own personal uh, testimonies about having been stuck in those uh, cycles. Uh, and the, how those behaviors uh, just took over. And none of these things are look appealing to me. I don't know about you guys. Does it look good for you? No. Oh, you know, I would tell my wife that she has mood swings. She really doesn't, but this would be where I inserted that joke. Well, I don't, I don't recommend that. Okay. But obviously, these are, there's things, these common behaviors that you can kind of pick up on as a cluster. I mean, you start, you go and start talking to somebody and... and uh, you know, you know that, that like what you just said wasn't true. Um, okay, maybe it was just, I, you know, write it off as who knows. But then when you start seeing a bunch of these things, you, it doesn't necessarily mean narcotics. But coupled with some of the things that we're going to see throughout the rest of the slide, it's going to, it, it may help you identify and even, like we said, uh, save somebody's life. All right. Now... Signs of, these are like, wait a minute, wouldn't this just be the same thing, but just a different way to say it? No. Um, these are things that I think you can, when you go into somebody's house, 
We judge. We do. People judge us more than ever because, well, we homeschool three boys in their barrel. Um, a, a, a sweet little girl that lives next door to us came over. My wife paid her, uh, you know, $12 an hour to come help clean up the boys' playroom. And I get home last night from an awards banquet and I'm like, well, I'm glad she tried. <laughs> I saw pictures earlier. There is a rug. But, but there's things when you go into somebody's home you can see. And we tend to pick up on these things a little quicker because it's not our house. Everything is out of order. And we can say, oh, things, well, I don't really want to sit on that chair. I don't know. I can't identify what that is or what that was. <laughs> so when you go into, the, when you happen to go into these homes and you start seeing things, we kind of can tuck those away and go like, they could just be poor housekeepers. They could just be not clean or they could be perfect. And there may be small indicators of things that like just are out of place. Now, as an investigator, I try to tell the new detectives that come in, we, there's not really any set path that you can tell. Oh, if you find, you do this and you'll find that, you do this, you'll find that, you do this, you'll find that, and then you get a fresh mark, go to jail. We high five, go eat a cupcake, and go eat coffee and donuts afterwards. <laughs> If it were that simple, I would not have a job because it would only probably take one detective to handle all the crimes of Smith County and we can go home. But as you know with Philip, we get case after case after case after case after case after case because none not one of them is the same. So I tell them if you will look for the things that are supposed to be there and they're not, okay, clue in on that. If you see things that are there that aren't supposed to be there, clue in on that. Because the faster that you can, if, especially for the, uh, uh, the folks that actually have to go into people's homes, it can get pretty sketchy pretty fast. If you can recognize problems faster and say, you know what, something's come up, I'll, you know, we'll have to reschedule and you can get out, you can call them, you can do that. So when you go into somebody's house, you can start thinking about when somebody starts uh, uh, abusing drugs and they're a drug, they're addicted to these things. Addiction, remember that strong hold. It's more than just like, hey, you're just doing drugs, and it, you know, that then takes precedence over all else. Okay, and this is important because this is where my child cases stem from. Well, they would never neglect their kids. How many here? If you're if you're embarrassed and don't want to answer this, I'll ask blunt questions, and I don't care. How many of you has anybody in here? Ever been addicted to narcotics? So we ain't we don't have a clue about what it's like to be addicted to narcotics. Okay, but we probably you may have known somebody. My wife will tell you she had an alcohol problem in college. So there's no alcohol in my house. I miss a good old fashioned cold beer, but I don't drink anymore. Why? Because my wife had a problem with that. Okay, so. When we are addicted to substances, we start neglecting a lot of areas in our life because that is that becomes the most important. That becomes priority number one, even at the expense of our family, our children, our jobs, hygiene, social, all of these things that that addiction takes priority. When our brains are chemically altered, there's no changing that, okay? Why do alcoholics go to Alcoholics Anonymous daily, sometimes multiple, multiple times a day, every day, once a week or once a month, and it doesn't stop? When you see somebody that's got that chip for 30 years, why is that a big deal? When you hear that person share their story about being addicted to drugs, and so for 10 years, they totally wrecked their lives, and they lost everything, but now they're functioning and doing everything right, and they are, they rebuilt their life. Why is that such a big deal? If you knew how far down the barrel they went, you would understand how far they had to come back just to start the start over process, Okay. So we start seeing these things manifest and when they neglect their responsibilities, cleaning, uh, bathing, things like that, when they start withdrawing socially, somebody that you try to find on, they're not, they start dodging your calls and you try to find them on social media, you can't. 
you call the number, it's disconnected, or things, and they are just withdrawing themselves in every way possible from social activity. <clears throat> Having to just talk on the phone sometimes. Who are introverts in here? Any introverted folks in here? <laughs> Semi. When I was crushed in my patrol car, got two brain injuries, I realized how I, I, I took on introverted tendencies. Didn't know that was a thing. I'm, I'm still at, obviously an extrovert, but there's some days I come home and I tell them, I, I, need, I need an hour, at least an hour, because I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to hear anybody. I don't want to hear sound. I don't want to see light. I, don't, I just want to sit in my nothingness. <laughs> and it's beautiful. Any introverts in here? <laughs> Blessings. <laughs> I get it. I've never understood that, and, but there's some people that just do that naturally. They're like, can't find them to talk to them. Another day. They might not just want to talk to you or anybody. So, again, you can't just take these things and go, oh, drink it, drink it, drink it, drink it. You can't just put the social limits on. No, but, but these, are, these are common. Changes in appearance. You ever seen somebody uh, uh, that you knew, friends with, church, work, whatever, and then 10 years later, they're arrested on, uh, and on KLTV, and you look at them, and they're like, they look like they got hit by a truck twice. And it's because of the drug use of their physical appearance. You use methamphetamines for a year or two, your teeth start losing their calcium and blackening and falling out, getting you know, nasty. You, you know, they, uh, it, it's an appetite suppressant, so they don't eat. And all of a sudden, somebody went from 250 pounds down to four pounds, and you're like, wow, I can't even recognize that person. So how long are, how long have you all dealt with the, like going to these families' houses? Do you, over a long period of time, have you, how, how long, what's, how, what kind of a time frame do you guys see, start seeing somebody and then have to continue visiting them? I don't know. I don't know what you do. You have a year. So there's a year. So in a year's time from you, first, the first, six years? Six. Possibly. When you get a year, two years, three years, you can start. You may not recognize it first because it's slow change sometimes, but then after when you look back, you're like, wait a minute. A lot of the appearance of things have changed. Okay. If you will uh if you'll Google search before and after methamphetamine mug shots or meth mug shots, they have the first time that, that person was arrested, and then usually two or three years down the road, the same person arrested. And you'll be able to see a distinct difference in skin. Weight, hair, just demeanor, sores, all sorts of things. And you'll, you'll, you'll better understand uh, the changing in appearance. Somebody that was had a good job, their clothing was clean, normal, and all of a sudden they've worn the same Star Wars t-shirt for two and a half weeks. May not be narcotics use, but something's wrong. But these are can be signs of abuse. So abuse cultivates abuse. When somebody's a, a narcotics abuser, uh, an addict, again, their violence can be triggered a lot easier. Their uh, willingness to be verbally or physically abusive depreciate, or the, the, the hindrance to do those things uh, depreciate. And abuse becomes easier and easier and more and more violent as they continue in their downward spiral uh, to the point of, like I said, working child crimes, those child abuse cases, a lot of those stems from narcotics abuse. Okay. And again, there's some, uh, uh, one of the papers that uh, is on the research slides that you can take a picture of when I get to them. We'll go more depth, more in depth. Okay. So what, if you haven't, yes, ma'am. Just a, a quick question. When you talk about the child abuse, are you saying the parents are abusing drugs or the kids are abusing Sometimes drugs? both. But typically it's the parents. Yeah, if there's parents uh, that are uh, addicts, their their kids are going to feel the brunt of that. Because instead of buying them shoes or food or things they need for school, they're buying meth, cocaine, crack rocks, marijuana, so on and so forth. Right. So, yeah. And... Uh, and that's, a, that's an unfortunate thing, is, again, the addiction becomes priority over all else. And um, we, our human nature still tries, we try to hide that as much as possible. And then it gets to a point where they just, nobody cares. Do you see a trend in the kids becoming abusive? And yes, there is definitely. Uh, 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 we, we are a product of our environment. 
Okay. Um, all the way back when the Bible was written, iron sharpens iron. It doesn't matter if you choose that iron or it, you just associate with that iron. Whoever you're around, you are not going to become more alive. Okay. Um, social learning theory. Um, I forget the guy's name. He was in the uh, University of Miami. He retired and was still teaching at 90 something years old. Bless that man. And back in the 60s, he realized that um, from that birth till about 13 years old for guys, and birth to about 11 or 12 for girls, there's this time frame that parents have to be that they are the number one influence on their child's growth, learning, and who they are, building in and establishing who they are. The second most influence, uh, influential source is their peers. Birth till 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and guys sometimes are dumb. Okay, all guys, we just don't get it for a while, a little slower on the learning curve. After that, those roles reverse. Okay, the peers become the more influential source in their life. Parents are taking the back seat, case in point. How many of you have uh, daughters? Okay, you got a daughter. Four-year-old daughter comes in with a dress. Daddy looks down and says, oh, are you a princess? Yes. Let it go. Let it go. Whatever. I hope that's recorded. Um, fast forward to when that child is, that girl's 15 years old. Oh, she comes down. She's in a dress. And daddy goes, oh, you look like a princess. Oh, oh. oh you're so embarrassing. What changed? I think it starts at 10. Not <laughs> that couldn't bear. But she, there, there was a paradigm shift somewhere in there. And it's no, I don't care what he thinks. I don't care what my peers think or something. There's another driving force behind it. So when you were in a house from the time that you were born or any time in there that you were then influenced by the use of narcotics by your home life, guess what? The likelihood of you doing the exact same thing is high. Or the pun or high. <laughs> so it is very so the it, it's very, very important to understand that that's why a lot of our children are repeat offenders of narcotics, the repeat offenders, thieves, the repeat offenders, violence, the repeat offenders, fill in the blank. We're, part, we're products of our environment. Okay. So, very good question. I talked a lot on that. That's a great question. All right. We talked about the, the abuse. All right. Here's some more of the person that you can start looking at. Um, a lot of narcotics, or narcotics will make your eye do a lot of different things. Uh, the most common one you see everybody on the, on the DWI videos. Why are we doing this? We're watching that, that horizontal gaze in the stagnant. Those eyes go dee, 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 and it's, it's involuntary. The eyes tell a lot about substance abuse. For alcohol, we test the eyes, and whether or not they can go back and forth. You see this part, and they track equally. It doesn't matter. You can't stop your eyes from being bouncy if you're under the influence of alcohol. If you if you do this with with somebody, you'll see their eyes smooth tracking, both eyes at the same time. So the eyes tell a lot of the story. Okay, with narcotics use, some of them make the pupils go shh, and some narcotics make them go very 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 tiny. Now, if you ever look, pull up a picture of David uh, David Bowie, he's got one that's, and one that's. <laughs> And it's a it's a, a disorder. It's a genetic disorder. Probably had some some narcotics in it yeah. too. But I'm just saying, he had a genetic. <laughs> that would be awesome. I've never thought about that. So the pupils are an indicator of something's up. Okay. Um, when should eyes be super 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 tiny? If it's the sunniest, brightest day outside, and for some reason somebody left the flood lamps on 10 feet from your face, your eyes are going to naturally 
the pupils are going to shrink down. Why? Because it, it that's how our eyes regulate light. If it's a dim living room and their pupils are well, that's normal. But then when it's pinprick size and it's dim, you know, we talked about things that are there that shouldn't be or things that should be there that are not. That's one of the things you kind of have to take into consideration. But pupils are very, very uh, good at indicating if something's up. Okay. Not enough by itself or with a, a few other things. You're going to need to see other things. And that's where paraphernalia comes in. We'll get to that. But the eyes are key. Bloodshot eyes. You guys have kids. What are some things that make eyes bloodshot other than narcotics or, or alcohol or Just kids? Yeah. Who's got boys? Uh, you let one boy punch the other boy in the eye, what's going to happen to their eye? Uh, even that, even the not talking about the, the black eye or the bruising, I'm talking about I mean, it's going to get bloodshot a little bit. Somebody sneezes real hard. You ever heard of petechial hemorrhaging? The little blood dots and, blood, and sometimes it's just bloodshot. Just because their eyes are bloodshot doesn't mean my boy's got a pink eye a month and a half ago. Guess what? They're, it's that's so nasty. <laughs> you know where pink eye comes from? You know what? I'm not even going to go get into that. Ugh. Boys are so gross. Oh. I thank my mom daily for not just disowning me for just being a dude. Yeah, I, uh, guess what? Their eyes were bloodshot. My boys no more. No, they don't even know what drugs are. They they refer abstractly to drugs as drugs because they're bad. That's the extent of their understanding. Bloodshot eyes don't always mean that they're drunk or high, but coupled with some of the things that we're going to look at, yeah. Poor hygiene, I don't know what it is, uh, but they uh, uh, drug addicts and poor hygiene go hand in hand. Okay. Um, it's, we go into houses, we, went, we, uh, we had a case yesterday. We went into a place where uh, they, they were known drug users and it, they tried some, but there was just something about it that was just it, the smell the, the, if you clean your house, who are my OCD leaders in here? I don't know. I just do what I'm told. Carrie said, hey, can you clean the bathroom? I know I better do everything right because it's going to be done again if I don't. But those things that even me, as I'm not an OCD house cleaner, but I do know if I see dust on this little edge, of, okay, you're supposed to wipe that off. There's little things that you just look like. Something's not right. Body odor, teeth, just poor hygiene. It goes hand in hand. Um, what you recognize with meth users is remember I said the blackening of the teeth that when it, start, it starts to pull the calcium out of the bones and the teeth. That's why they rot. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Way well, you're interviewing them and you're like two feet away from them. <laughs> but Poor hygiene. Now, methamphetamine is a very, very popular common drug because it's very cheap and it's easy to get, especially since the cartels started piping it up from Mexico in the last 20 years. Excessive scratching and sores. Um, when you're coming down off of a meth high, you, you get exhausted and your body goes through a bunch of physiological things, but one thing is your nerves begin to make you think that you're itching and it feels like bugs are all over you. So and there's sores on their face, on their arms, just scabs and seeping wounds. Glad we're, I'm glad we're eating lunch because <laughs> this is it's a great table talk, but it's, it's just, they can't stop scratching. Cocaine users. Yeah. That booger sugar is getting to them. <laughs> so there's there's a lot of this is those are the types of indicators you might want to just do a little research on because we could list pages page after page after page after page of these interesting indicators. But things that are like got a cold. Have you been sick? Because if you've been sick, I don't want to. Oh no, I'm fine. <laughs> Grand, granddaughter wiping her nose on your sleeve is a little different than somebody sitting on your ass or whatever. So, but that kind of goes along with the excessive scratching because that's common. Meth is very common, even for people that you would blow your mind if you knew that 
they were meth users. Meth is a very, very powerful stimulant. People that work a lot of hours, you probably heard speed is a name that some of you use. They can tell you, you can get methamphetamine in pill form, take it, and it just, I mean, it ramps you up. It's what Adderall is. But for people like me that are ADHD, it actually levels. It has a different re response in my brain that it does. Some of these just taking it to get high. Okay. Um, they, people will people buy Adderall for $20, $30 a pill if they can't get a prescription for it. I'm like, no, I like to focus. I can't exist without it. So it's different to me than somebody that just abuses it. And so people that you, you would never question of using narcotics might surprise you. Okay. Um, cases are confidential that when we work these cases, but, um, you know, the, the names that we've seen, I've seen personally in my career are people that you would never believe are narcotics users. Some people have a better handle on their addiction than others, but all that leads to is, is when you start seeing the repetition of several of these indicators that we're talking about, about poor hygiene and signs of abuse, the behaviors and all that, it might be worth looking into, okay? Because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different things, you might have to do a little more research, okay? Again, this is scratching the topic, uh, just very tip of the iceberg thing. Now, the effects on children is no surprise to us, okay? I know it's not to you. Um, I hope it's not a surprise because you wouldn't be here if you are new. And guess what? It's going. It might be a surprise when you when you first started. Was it kind of shocking to hear some of the things that our kids had to go through? Yeah. Um, the effects on children can be are they really the same on anybody that is affected directly and indirectly by narcotics abuse. Okay, but but specifically with children, you, you, we're, we're taking all of their years. Not somebody that lost their job at 45 years old and they just went to a downward down spiral and they spent the last 15, 20 years of their life as an addict. But these kids that are coming into this world addicted to narcotics. That is where uh, we have to be very cognizant and mindful about the effects. You know, permanent brain damage. Oh, there was a glare. Uh, physical trauma. Okay. Okay. Um, that could be, for kids, the indirect associate parents, abusive parents. Um, there was a, uh, I worked a capital murder case uh, back in 2017. A uh, 19-year-old dad killed his four-month-old daughter because she wouldn't stop crying. Mm -hmm. What was he doing right before that? He was getting high. Okay. Now, only, again, taking one slice out of ex uh, my existence in, as an investigator and saying, oh, well, if he wouldn't have been doing narcotics, he wouldn't be doing this. Well, that's not necessarily true. He was just a violent, evil man. But anything from verbal uh, uh, abuse to death, I've seen firsthand parents with uh, narcotics abuse issues and addiction run that whole gamut of violence. Okay. Physical trauma uh, isn't just from abuse. You take a, a parent that smokes methamphetamine, smokes crack, just like you, you walk into a house that the whole family smokes and you know it immediately. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm in line at the grocery store and the person in front of me, I know that they are a smoker. Why? Because that odor emanates off of us. Um, so you got somebody that's in a house, two parents smoking all of these chemicals that weren't designed to be burned and inhaled. Okay. Uh, the kids are breathing that in too. Okay. Uh, that's, you know, damaging their lungs. That's damaging their brain. That's damaging their physical bodies are being damaged by the actual indirect exposure to narcotics. You take a little kid that goes and, grab, you know, is messing with that stash of meth. And it's laced with fentanyl. That doesn't sound pleasant. It's not. Fentanyl will kill you instantly. Okay. So the, the physical trauma and the physical damage that could take place uh, is surface level that you would probably you can probably see things like that a lot easier. Uh, you probably already have some of these kids coming from homes that are 
uh, addicts. Permanent brain damage. Uh, the uh, secondary high, if you're right, if you ever, who's going to a concert from anybody that was a musician uh, from uh, 1970 to 80 and then 70 back to, okay. You go to one of those concerts, guess what? You don't have a secondary high because band starts, security guards turn their backs and look the other direction, make sure nobody with machine guns come in, everybody lights up and you can smell it. The reason I know that is man. Well, I, you know, with how marijuana is so pervasive now, mm -hmm. even though it's still illegal here, I mean, people are so open with it that mm -hmm. they are smoking it every day with their kids in the house. And, you know, they wouldn't dare smoke a cigarette with their kid because of secondhand smoke. Some of them, right? Right. I mean, the I, I know users, but uh, they think it's so okay that yep. they don't even think about that secondhand smoke. Well, I'm going to show you something that's going to gross you out later when we start talking about sec like residues and things like that. Cool. Uh, but uh, brain damage from that second, look, you've got an infant in there, you know, and their house is filled with a cloud of smoke from smoking crack, smoking meth, smoking uh, cigarettes, anything like that, you're, there's going to be some issues, some cognitive issues uh, develop. Uh, mental health problems, once again, remember, one exacerbates the other, direct or indirect, it doesn't matter. Uh, you think that the, the, the physical and uh, verbal abuse that the kids take doesn't affect them mentally? Absolutely. Well, we know that. These are things that are not uh, uncommon. We get that. So I'm, that's why I'm, I'm doing a little more of of this stuff, but the emotional damage, how they uh, are able to deal with their emotions and all that. Again, that social learning theory comes into play, but the inability to control that based on uh, their the influence of narcotics and, and things like that. Again, emotional damage, mental health problems could be considered, sometimes overlap, but we're gonna br break those down separately because um, my eight-year-old has never, Use drugs in his life, but he has a, he has problems with his emotions. He's a very very uh, he gets in his feels a lot. He's super intelligent. Um, was do anybody algebra fans of algebra in here? Just to see where he was when he was four, he could solve for x. Oh, you know, just numbers. Asperger's does, has he, numbers is his thing. He's too smart for his own good because he's. He, he can recognize his anger, he can recognize it, but he doesn't understand how to control his emotions and his outbursts from it. And so you've got kids that struggle and have problems in school and stuff, and it could very well be exposure to narcotics or indirect exposure by the parents. Uh, a lot of these, the mental health issues and the emotional issues we have with our kids these days is a direct link to narcotics and all. Um, again, one thing I love about UT is when you graduate and while you're going through your master's, your access to the library and all those journals, you keep that access for the rest of your life. So there are page, there are papers and hundreds and thousands of peer-reviewed data research on these they, they, these how every little thing, some group of scientists somewhere or researchers somewhere have linked these things and proven that. Narcotics addiction and abuse, directly or indirectly, have these effects on our kids, okay? It would take me longer to read these papers to you than just to tell you about it. But that's why I gave, I'm going to give you some links. But the social struggles. you got kids that everybody in their school knows that mom and dad are meth heads, knows that they're using crack cocaine. They know that their parents are potheads. Some kids go to school and wear it like a badge of honor. Because they're right there with mom and dad doing it. Or maybe not doing it, but they're like, well, my mom won't let me do that yet, but when she does, I'm going to. So you, you, you get stigmatized as like a so and so kid. Or that's so and so. She does the drugs or whatever. And for the rest of their life, their ability to socially connect is altered, destroyed, or could be hampered in, in so many ways beyond uh, our understanding. Uh, raise your hand if you were an adult before Facebook was introduced in 04. Social lives and social connectivity is different from when you were growing up than it is now. How many of you could do something in um, 
1975 and instantaneously it be known about on the other side of the world. Anybody remember the first news story that instantly went viral? Monica Lewinsky. Oh, wow. That was the first story that went viral and was around the world within minutes. Okay. What year was that? That was mid-90s. Okay. So the children that lived through the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and up into the 90s are living under a totally different set of rules socially. Talk about social learning theory. The social construct of the home life and the social construct of their peers' life. That's why we choose to homeschool our, our boys, part of the reason. There's some things with the issues that our boys have that I know is not going to click well with a classroom with one teacher and 31 to 41 students in it. My eight year old punched somebody in the throat. He just can't control it yet. We're working on it. He has not punched anybody in the throat. But I know their limitations, and I know that that's not going to benefit them. So you've got kids getting shoved into these situations at home and with their peers that will royally damage their social connectivity and their ability to do so healthily for the rest of their life. Okay. All right. Who wants to see a bunch of cool pictures? <laughs> I'm a visual learner. Who are my visual learners in here? Yes. I'm a visual and I'm an auditory. So I can sit here and listen to me talk all day long, and I can sit and look at the pictures that I put on there all day long. I'll be happy. If you're not a visual learner, they're still cool. All right. Let's talk about rolling papers. You go into a house, if you're in a, in a living room or something, and you see these, anybody's grandfather or father or, or have rolled cigarettes with zigzags or rolling papers with it? That doesn't mean they're drug users, though. <laughs> By itself, you can't say, ah, zigzags, because they still sell tobacco <laughs> that's unrolled. And a lot of people still roll their cigarettes. It's just so convenient that they made these papers. If you put marijuana in it, you can roll them just the same. And it's so easy. By itself means absolutely nothing. It does give me probable cause to search a car, though. <laughs> Because of the, in my training and experience, I know what zigzags are commonly used for. You got two 16-year-old boys in the car going paranoid and anxious. You look down, you see zigzags, and they roll the window down and just plumes of smoke. And you're like, woo! You just step out of the vehicle. A little different. But when you're in somebody's house and you see these things, you're like, okay, whatever. Zigzags, rolling papers. There's a whole bunch of different types of rolling papers. But you can kind of see that might not be something that you just recognize. You're like, oh, is that? Still using them, though? I thought they were smoking. Like, I'm sorry, in a pipe. Yeah, where you'll get to. A lot of people still roll the old fat. A lot of people still old school. They will roll them and smoke them. So there you go. Don't go running out of here saying I taught you how to roll <laughs> weed. If, if one of y'all does it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, your nickname for life is going to be zigzag. But yeah, I mean, it's just like a, it's just like the smoking tobacco. You know, it's no different. They they roll it, or they push the end on. Okay, so what? All right, anybody ever seen one of those? That's a grinder. So when you get marijuana, oh, we'll look at it later. And it's in clumps. You smash it down in there, smash that on it, and they spin all the, the top and the bottom. The ones on the top will spin in between the, the teeth on the bottom, and it grinds the marijuana up. That's more bougie. That's more my style. If I, was, if I was gonna smoke dope and smoke some weed, and I was gonna grind it, I'll get one of those. That's pretty bad at the moment. All right. There's four different layers. There's four different, there's some cheap ones and there's some, this is a more high-end one, not just because of the diamonds, but you grind and then it has a 
section that catches all what they call the shape, the seeds and the bigger parts that can't get ground out, they just stay big. And all the good smokable goodness goes down to, you notice there's a little, looks like a little mesh on that third layer. It catches it nice there. And all the good stuff, real good stuff can, can even go down to the bottom. You don't want to get rid of that. You can smoke that up too. It's good stuff. If you like that. There's one kind of broken apart. Uh, what does that little brush look like? Any men have a hair trimmer, beard trimmer? Guess what? It comes with one of those. That's pretty much identical. Well, you got to clean that. You don't want any old dried up weed getting in there. And when you, you want to get, make sure it's all fresh when you grind it up. So, Tim, yes, what size is this? I'm picturing yeah. like a compact, like that. Yes, that is, that is what we're looking at right there. Wow. Let's go back to the pretty ones. But if you saw that sitting on your shelf <laughs> or sitting around somewhere, it looks like it could be face cream or something. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, just like, wow, that's, what is that? Some of them are not labeled. But that is the, that's the, it, it's just a little, little thing. Well, and they had different grades for making your butter and your oil and your. Oh, yeah, we'll get in, we'll get in all that. But this is specifically for marijuana. <laughs> Grinding it up. Yeah, that's a very cookies, good question. Yeah, cooking with it. Yeah, but the size, it's, it's something that can be in, in there. You may never see this stuff. But it, and it's about that tall. Go to Washington, you'll see it. <laughs> Heard the same about Colorado too, <laughs> and I'm, I I love going to Colorado, but I have like to show you their stuff. Too. I haven't been to Colorado in a decade because I just can't stand the panhandling. And you can't go to Durango, Colorado, and sit outside drink a cup of coffee, and without somebody coming up and bugging you for ten bucks, so they can go get some weed. That's where I'm Bless born. their hearts. Love me some Colorado. I'm born in Durango. When it burned, I almost bought ten acres. Really? Because you can buy very, very awesome location dirt if it's just been scorched. The Missionary Ridge fire? Mm -hmm. Back in, I think it was back in the late night, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Early 2000s. Yeah. yeah. Move. Because I almost took a job at a church there, First Baptist oh, wow. Church of Durango. What? So, uh, even whether I was going to I was going to buy 10 acres of that land because right now it's beautiful. But this is the things we miss out on. Part of me looking at that weed like, oh, what am I missing out on? Nothing. <laughs> Perfectly content. But uh, these, a lot of the things that I'm going to show you paraphernalia-wise are small, except for the balls. Some of those get quite huge. All right. But those are these are the grinders. That's they're gonna. <laughs> you see that? That's probable cause for me to search your car because it's likely that you didn't put your Tylenol in there to crush it up. Now they do have grinders for pills because my stepdad. Could not swallow a pill. It would get close to the back of his tongue. He'd throw up. Super sensitive gag reflex. So he'd have to crush Tylenol, sprinkle it in a little Dr Pepper down. Mm -hmm. I don't know where I was influenced in my con things of consumption, <laughs> but that's not. And, and so it's different. But these things are very specific. You're not doing anything else with a weed grinder. You're just not going to. I don't see anybody making salads. <laughs> I don't think that Gordon Ramsay uses a weed grinder to elevate his arugula salad that he puts on top of every dish he makes with a quail egg. Sidetrack. Now, doesn't that look delicious? Yeah. That is one of, that's probably one of the most common types of glass pipes, smoking pipes that I see and have seen in my career uh, where people will smoke meth or crack okay my aunt god bless her is a crack addict and a meth addict she's been since she was 12 years old she's 64 now she's still in jacksonville and when i was a cop in jacksonville you think that caused some issues mm -hmm. no because lynn was lynn regardless of who you were if i asked her lynn give me your pipe if she didn't have drugs on her. Mm. If she said, I don't have the pot. Man. And that went back to the neuro linguistics that just, when she started getting, Lynn, every time that we dealt with you, when you refused to turn over your pipe, you, we know you have drugs. 
bag of crack or a little bag. Yeah. But that's that's the style of pipe that she used, and it's what most people use. They're very cheap. You can get them uh, Amazon. Hey, you can go to eBay and Amazon and get meth pipes. Now, sometimes they're not just like that. Sometimes they, they have different appearances. But remember I, saw, I said that I, you're going to see something, and we're going to talk about residue. What do you think the white stuff is towards the... Uh, the, the, that's about the back last third of it. That's methamphetamine. Okay, and you can see in the bold portion that the bold portion of that pipe and mm -hmm. there, there's a white substance up there. Okay, so what they do is hold it way back there where the residue is, and they put a lighter. I'm gonna show you a picture of that here in a second, and then and that, it melts and boils the methamphetamine or the crack or whatever, the heroin or whatever they're trying to, until what, what, who's my physics folks in here? What are the, so, are the states of matter? Solid, liquid, and? Yes. And we breathe. There you go. Wouldn't that hurt? Some people say it hurts. It's excruciating. But when you're getting high, you don't care. And when you just burn the lining of your throat and your mouth and your side, it doesn't matter anymore. Wow. All right, there are some more colorful ones. Wow. <laughs> That's for my visual folks. <laughs> Those are a little more uh, uh, common because you can get those at, they call them head shops, the, the smoke shops will sell those because a lot of people still will smoke certain types of tobacco through those. And, um, but yeah, or we, you can smoke, uh, you stuff it down on top, throw your lighter on top and, and burn it and you smoke it straight through. And you don't, the reason those are so common is you, cigarette, you light it, and it's steadily just burning, slowly burning your tobacco. Weed's a little more expensive, not much, but a little more expensive than cigarettes. So you, you know, you want all of it. You're not gonna let it just sit there and burn, but you'll pass smooth out if you just sit there and inhale nothing but weed smoke. So you light it every time and you smoke it. Hold it, breathe it out, I exhale, I don't care. I don't know. I'd be lying to you if I, I, I don't know if I would hold it all in or if I'd just smoke it and blow it all out. I don't I've never done it. But it goes out. You light it again when you do it again. So, uh, but that's you know things like that. You start seeing stuff like that. Not very many people smoke tobacco with those. Mm -hmm. They're going to just go buy cigarettes. Okay. Remember that's what that's the that's the process. Just drop your rock or your crystals down the the tube. You go hold it down into the bowl. The bowl. Put a light to it. And so. There's a hole in the hole in the top. When you inhale, it drafts all of the vapor straight into your lungs. Okay. Now, what does the oxygen do and carbon dioxide do when it? What do your lungs do? They take the oxygen and put it directly in your bloodstream. What an amazing way to get high! Cigarettes, cigars, and nothing's new about this. It's just. Nothing's different. Meth, heroin, crack, doesn't matter. Okay? A bong. That's kind of cool. What the heck is that? Anybody familiar with those? See? You know what's, what the difference is a bong and a, than a bong and a pipe? The, 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 down there by the hand, that's, that's half, it's about half to three to two thirds full of water. Mm -hmm. And so, in the, this portion right here, you put your weed in there, burn it, and that's about the same size as those little colorful bowls. If you hear somebody say smoking a bowl, there it is. There's your bowl. And you inhale through that. Now, you see there's a tube that goes down into the water. Okay. And when the, when the smoke goes through that water, it totally changes the high. And it comes back up through the surface because there's a direct pressure of incoming air and smoke coming through. And it's going to come right out of the, it'll go through the water and come right out of the top. And if you watch a video, you'll hear it bubbling when they're inhaling. And it's a totally different high. And they say it's a total, it's a better high. But can you just shove a bong in your pocket and you drive down the street? It's frowned upon. Broken glass, minimum, getting arrested because there's a big bong hanging out of your pocket or your purse. I don't know. But there's a, that's kind of cool. That one fills this whole bowl. That's pretty cool. I, I snatched that from a video. 
and the water's down under there. And so you, yeah, I don't know. It's crazy. Wait a minute. People smoke weed and stuff with that. Yeah, it's a keychain. Oh, wow. How many of you didn't see the little keychain at, at first? And just because when oh we're looking at oh it's a bomb oh it's a bomb oh look at the pipe and then all of a sudden it that's how easily they can be overlooked. We miss stuff like that all the time when we are doing search warrants on houses. So I mean that's pretty wild. Look at that one. Gosh. Turn it around backwards and you just have the laws or a base. <laughs> Or a base if you're from Texas. We'll call it a boss. Exactly. Special. But that's wild. I'm gonna laugh if, if you call and say, hey, you remember that one you sure look like a like a little lady said, I saw one. Here's a picture. Oh my goodness. Hmm. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Kind of like the same concept as in the hookah. Yes. Okay. But guess what? Can you smoke through a hookah pot? We they have hookah, hookah shops all over. Mm -hmm. Like I used to live in San Diego. They're here in town. Like, um, yeah, you can get all this stuff now. Yeah. Does it look different? The hookah pipe? Uh, it does. He, it, 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 if somebody it's is simple, if you'll, several people at it's for a group. Oh, I see. People, and then uh, the hookah pipes were tobaccos, uh, Middle East, uh, Middle East influence on our military and all that coming back. And guess what? The guy that went over, guess what? They smoked a hookah pipe, but it's uh, there's tobaccos and things like that. They smoked and some of them smoked weed. Uh, but uh, I didn't put those on just because they're not quite mainstream enough to for what we would see on a normal basis. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing we're doing well. Syringes. Who who are my diabetics in here? You ever had to use one of those? Know somebody that has? Freaking drug addicts. Because <laughs> you got a syringe. Well, that's what they inject. They'll uh, uh, cook their meth, their coke, their crack, their meth, all the every, heroin, everything. And they'll put it in those because they're tiny needles, and you can dose easier with the small ones and not overdose as easy. Unless you're just let's go for it all in with one of the big guys. I don't know. That's that's scary to think about. But you know what you're going to see more than you're going to see the whole syringe. See that little orange cap right there. Yeah. That's what you're going to, that's what we see more than anything. If they haven't done the drugs, they'll be complete needles. They'll be the whole syringe set. If, the, if they've already injected their dope, we see a lot of caps. We see both, then what does that tell you? You got more than, you got multiple uses. Uh, some people reuse needles, some, some people don't. It's unhealthy to reuse needles. I didn't say any of this had to make sense, but... But we know that I gave myself Ozempic injections, but it was with an auto injector. But don't you think there's medications that, be, yes, uh, there are people that use those needles to inject medication daily, if not more times a day. I used to do allergy shots. Yeah. Guys that take testosterone shots, it's a little bigger than those, but it's not. It, this, these are okay to have in your home. But coupled with a bunch of the other things, if you start seeing, that's a little different. Or you, uh, you slip in the question is like, uh, are anybody in the house diabetic or anything, any medical issues like that? And they go, no. And you're sitting there going, okay, why? Wait. But, okay. Jot that down or something. You know, those are the, that's what we're trying. Well, that's when we start looking at what's, why is that there if you don't have a reason to inject yourself with anything kind of thing? That's the mindset that I'm talking about, of recognizing this stuff. Um Opening needles, that, that was just a, that's just what it, ugh. but. Um, so you said they keep the the orange cap, wouldn't they just throw the needles away? And Somebody wants that heroin so bad, it's like when you get that brand new fresh pack of double stuff Oreos and you're just like, I'm going to destroy you. And you tear open the package, you grab two, <laughs> at least, of the cookies, and, and you get your big old glass of milk. And then you get, and then Carrie calls in the uh, delivery room and says, Tim, I see you're having milk and Oreos. And she's standing in the kitchen because the package is wide open. The milk still left out, doesn't have a cap on it. The refrigerator door still hanging wide open. Because when that 
drug is that caps go flying. Things just that's that's priority is getting it getting it. So, so you see those they're discarded. Not the, not the need. We find them a lot in cars of, of uh, uh, needle it's users. Trash. It's just trash. So Tim, why are syringes prescription then? Um, that I don't know. I know that uh, a lot of your pharmacies won't give them to you unless you have a prescription. I don't know if that's law or if that's like Walgreens policy or a lot of your pharmacies aren't going to give you syringes. They used to be. Unless you live in San Francisco yeah. and then they're like, here's all the syringes. <laughs> we don't want you to reuse and uh, it's unhealthy to reuse. I think you can order it from Amazon. But that's where the, that's where you can get your bongs, your pipes. I, I know that. And, Oh, some of you are friends, or your friends, all of you buy all the syringes. Yeah, there, there, there's there's no way to really for me to say that's out of my lane. But again, even if it were illegal, there's there's always. And if you know somebody that's about to have a baby, and you know those little stupid no sucker things that they sell at Walmart that are only this big, but the ones at the hospital that go in there and suck half their brain out, you can go to those on Amazon too. You got to work 20 at a time, but the bigger bulbs, the no sucker bulbs that you can get at the hospital. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Parental get, gifts to new parents, get the big ones, big green ones. <laughs> but you can get everything on Amazon that even if it's even if it's regulated sometimes by pharmacies or whatnot. Well, it's it's like with meth, mm -hmm. meth addicts, when they can't get the meth and they they would get the pseudopen, mm -hmm. they buy pseudopen, and they would just they can buy it in bulk. Well, while. they make no, they make the meth out of Sudafed, right? Mm -hmm. And so, that people make you can make that you can make meth in a two two liter bottle, Coke bottle now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's no longer the little the big labs because you need to get it from Mexico or you can make it yourself. But yeah, things like that, all anything. Uh, it's actually against the law for me to tell you what all the components of meth is, but every one of them, I guarantee you, are. Uh, are yeah, okay. I, I know. Well, are you trying to get me break the law? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like our son's his biological mom, our our baby that we adopted, who's grown now, but still, that's what she would get arrested for because she would go. They would catch her with all that. She would buy it in bulk mm -hmm. for them to cook it and make right. the meth. And they did for a long time until now. You can't do that. Right. You're not, uh, Everything's regulated. Yeah. You can't buy anything without at least being carded and it being documented somehow. Even some of the stuff you can get at the uh, uh, some cleaning supplies that can be. Uh, yes. That's getting Walmart. You don't think that every time you swap your car no, or you that. pay even with cash? Why do you think there's cameras? Above you and on you, because when I have a case that involves Walmart, I call their in, their investigators, their international investigator unit, and say, "Hey, here's a here's a debit card. This was used. Uh, uh, we think this was used in Walmart to buy gas cans for an arson fire. Do I give me twenty minutes? Hang up. You get an email, and it's the video, the how it was paid, what else was paid. Everything that you get is logged. Yeah." If it's on one of those lists, if it's a control or a, uh, a documented product, guess what? You better say cheese. <laughs> that's getting logged. Not that you're going to do anything inappropriate with it, but if somebody ever questions, like, yeah, he actually bought this X, Y, and Z together. Or over a week's time, came in every day and bought a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's all... It, don't buy your illegal stuff or stuff you want to make illegal things with from Walmart. What? what? Meth labs. Oh yeah. Like, but they're made. It's not a lab. Yeah. You make it. You you, you can you, you, make you cook it on your stove and cultivate it and with a mobile home blow. Yeah. Yeah. Baggies. It's so cheap now. Yeah. That and that's just it. That's why labs are uh, everything making it yourself. It's just not worth the trouble. Uh, the cartels are doing a, a really good job of bringing some high quality. Uh, methamphetamines in this country. Um, talk about discarded trash with the caps. This is another thing. I, I, I snapped a picture of one of these in that search warrant yesterday. Let me check my trash can. Okay. When you order that baby bed, 
that whatever from Ikea that you know you're going to have to build, what do the little screws sometimes come into? They're coming in blister packs now, but sometimes they come in little baggies. So if you see one of those, don't just automatically assume that they're meth heads. But if you start seeing stuff like that, that's a little different. Scary. Yeah. You know, if I was in the hardware business, that's what I would put all the nuts and bolts in. <laughs> Have a fine day. Enjoy your easy <laughs> bag. No, that's that's when you that that stuff, those are brands in the narcotics world, especially in the bigger cities, when you everybody knows whose stuff is what. There are dictionaries and catalogs that you can look through, law enforcement can look through, and a name is attached to that. A What's name or a group is attached. I don't know. He's kind of cute. The, uh, you know, this one right here. Dragon. Where do you think that's coming from? Japan or There's going to be there's going to be uh, somebody from an Oriental gang or something that's distributing. It's their calling card. Bob Marley. He never smoked weed. <laughs> don't worry. Probably yeah. when he was breathing. And then everything's going to be all right. <laughs> some some three little birds. <laughs> I used to sing that to my boys. I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> But when you got your low time dealers, like your low level guys, that they buy buy a stash, but they sell some of it so they can keep funding their habit. Those little Ziploc bags, you can hardly you can tear the door, but the ones that don't aren't those are expensive to have the little Ziploc on them. You can just get the little cheap ones and put a pin on or just tie it in a knot. But we find that all the time. Okay. There's some, it's a little hard to see in the but the little knot, and they just tear the bottom, they tear the drug off the bottom of it, discard that. Okay. Now, remember I said you got, uh, I said there's something you're going to see that's gross. And people that are needle users and they are very good at hiding it. And, and what do you think they're going to do with that spoon when they're done with it? They they're going to wash it and throw it right back in their silverware drawer. Hopefully they'll wash it. Um, Thank well, again, it's, if if if, you, if people are coming to their house and they're not going to want a lot of this stuff just laying around because it you, it looks like that when you don't wash it, when you reuse it, and that's kind of gross. That's pretty disgusting, right? Yeah, but spoons aren't illegal. The last time I checked, in fact, bowl of cereal that I had, I, it was. I, I'm confessing. <laughs> I had a bowl of chocolate chips and it was delicious. And I used the big spoon, not the little spoon. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, who ever thought a spoon? Just a simple thing. We our mindsets don't we can't just grasp a lot of this. It's a spoon, and uh, and they hold the pot where they put it in their mouth, and they get it to a boil, and they got their shrimp right there. Would it still have a residue on it after it's been through the very well? Because you think about. Metals, woods, plastic, it can be smooth to the touch, but their their surfaces are porous. They're gonna they're gonna have the capability of holding on. What are you also doing? What what happens to metal when you heat it? Expands. Expands. So you've got some major issues when you start heating things like that. So residues are you could throw. You could probably throw a spoon that's been used to and through the dishwasher and swab it, and you could still. There's a, probably a likelihood of you testing positive for uh, narcotics but on the swab. Wow, they're both they're yeah. very well, and that's that indirect uh, exposure that I'm talking about. They didn't choose to shoot up heroin, but you know that, and it's it's just everywhere. And it's spit. You know, so there's you know the spoon. So let's real quick. I know I'm I'm pushing the envelope here on time and cutting into your question time, but this is the this is what stuff looks like. And it's okay. There's a guy I went to gra uh, graduated police academy with and became a best friend. And you should never be best friends and on the same night shift as rookie police officers. But we were and yes, the statute of limitations has run its course. No, it wasn't that bad. We had a lot of fun together, but he had never smelled or seen marijuana before well our instructor was a dea agent and so what did he do he said well i'll be here next i'll be here again tomorrow so i'll, I'll bring something we'll light it up 
and he lit it up and for and said hey he wasn't the only one there's two or three other folks that had never smelled burning marijuana or the marijuana itself so they did i'm not going to do that for you yet to, you know <laughs> mary joe would skin my hide and she would yeah i would never be invited back but but at least being able to look at it and go uh okay that's before it goes into the grinder you remember the the rolling paper how it was broken apart that's what the grinder's for it gets it from that state into that uh where it can be smoked and there's a little bit of both you got a lot of the uh, uh chunks and then you've got this stuff that's ground uh, remember I said it's shake uh, that's the, the exit the stuff that you, the, you don't that's all the you, know, you see the little sticks and the seeds and the things that are that's the stuff that they they get out of it when they grind it and they'll smoke it when they run out of the good stuff <laughs> sometimes sometimes but you know uh, that if that was just like sticking out of a from under a, a magazine it looked like just a half smoked cigarette but there there's a distinct odor to a marijuana anybody in here never smelled it? burning marijuana or that you know of it's pungent it's it's kind of one of those smells like oh somebody's smoking i can tell and if not it's no it's it's, it's actually okay if you've never been in that lifestyle if it's okay if you've never been around it i'm not going to judge too much but it's but this is that's the marijuana now these are gaining more and more popularity if you saw that in somebody's house would you give it a second glance how many of you just now recognize because I'm saying it, it says stony charms and not lucky charms? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. What's something else you see about those packages that you would be, wouldn't be normal for real Cheetos, real lucky charms, or anything else? The color's different. Could be. We're at the very top of the. Resealable? Yeah. Resealable. Yeah. Okay. Seal. Why would you? Why would cereal you comes in the cheapest packaging Cheetos. possible. Cheetos, I'm sorry. But there ain't a cheese it left in that package. That's, <laughs> that's just she. She's like I'm putting mine away. I don't want to. There ain't a Cheeto in that bag. You don't need to reseal that bag. So that's something. That's why is that there? How many of you notice the Lucky Charms are actually just weed plants, marijuana plants? The oh, way. Yes. Where did that come from? And the rainbow. There's little marijuana plants on the rain. Tim, we got a question. Okay. So, if someone has a prescription for medical marijuana in Texas, what are the ramifications for that being legal, and how is that distributed? I don't want to cop. I have a prescription. You have a prescription. You have to approve the prescription. So, I say this louder over here. Is the microphone over here? Um, the question was, if you have a prescription for medical marijuana, number one, you don't smoke medical marijuana. You don't take a pill, you're going to swallow it. Well, I have glaucoma, so I'm smoking weed. Not true. It's going to, if you have a prescription for anything, you have a prescription for it. Okay. Um, but just like anything else, you have a prescription for it, you have to have it in the container that it's been provided in. And you, because they're all on the label is proof that that is your name, that is your doctor, and it could be easily shown. If you have a prescription, you have a prescription. That's the bottom line. Well, People to know in case somebody was like, oh, I have a prescription, but they are just smoking something right. they were given. Right. You don't smoke, the medical marijuana is not going to be smoked. You're going to take it, it's going to be in a medical great form. Mm -hmm. It's coming from a pharmaceutical company and not Donald Hara. Yeah. Don't work. Yeah. So Oreos, huh? Stonios. Are we missing an F on double stuff? Yeah. Oh, wow. Stoner's favorite cookie, weed behind the milk and the Oreo. Wonder what that's laced with. Okay. Like, wait a minute. And there you have the resealable package. Uh, Oreo packages don't last long in the house. We don't, if we didn't receive them, they, they would be okay. They wouldn't get sick. Gummies. Is this mostly like high school kids that you see had this? It's everybody. Adults. THC in Texas is a felony, no matter what form it is. I'm not talking about CBD oil. That's not even in this presentation. I'm talking about THC evidence, gummy bears. Now, Tell me something. If you had a little kid and there were gummy bears on that coffee table, my children would go, mother, father, 
there are gummy bears on that table. May I partake in such sustenance? That's what my kids would do. Yeah. yeah. No, if a child ate that, they'll be rolling on the floor, drooling, and pass smooth out. People don't realize that THC, one gummy, is the dose. Yeah. And they're like, these, these suck. And then they wake up next Thursday and somebody has to go find their left shoe. I mean, I mean, so that is a, that's why it's important to understand that they come in packaging that are very discreetly, but yet so obvious. That is not an obvious form of THC. What is THC? That's the same thing. As There's a lot of three good <laughs> words crammed together, and they just call it THC for people mm -hmm. like me that I can just say THC. But is it? The marijuana it's from the marijuana. It's, der it's a derivative of the hash. Uh, or hashish portion of the mirror. It's the oil from it, Megan, and that it's oh. it's consumable that way, and it's a lot more potent okay. than just smoking the, the leaves. Brownie, leaves, candy, no, THC. You notice the little uh, sour patch worms or whatever? There's one right there in the very middle, two of them in the middle right there. My, my, my boys love that. I don't like sour. THC oil. What is that? That's just an electric, an e-cigarette. Have those become a lot more popular? Instead of dropping your pepperoni pizza flavored smoke juice is what that's how you cut it. Drop THC in there, smoke it. And yes, there is actually a pepperoni flavor. Smoke for like these, it is disgusting. But THC. But it's a sour patch on it, sour patch candy, same thing. You're still you're like, why aren't they getting sued? Well, it's a legal business. They're not gonna, they don't care if you sue them, they're not gonna respond, they're not gonna do it. Who's gonna know who actually manufactures the stuff, anyways? And there you could be as simple as a oil dropper. So that's CBD, and I no, and there's big fat marijuana plant on it. CBD companies will have some indication of it's from the marijuana plant, and it doesn't make it bad. Okay. Do you use CBD? No, I can't use CBD because I'll pop positive on a marijuana test. But I'm not sitting there saying that it's illegal. Uh, CBD might be illegal, but I'm not. We're splitting hairs at this point. THC can come in the same oil form, and you drop it in an e-cigarette, you can smoke it the same. Methamphetamine, that's exactly what it looks like. There is no deviation other than tint and color. I'll show you a different uh, hue of Blue that it may be, but it looks like crystals. Cook it in a cookie sheet, and they they shatter it, and they break it up into small crystals. Now the part that you may see in the little baggies is you see the tiniest crystals. That's how fine they'll break it up because they can weigh it out easier when the, when. That and then that's canceled. what you melt. And that's what you melt, and you can or you can even crush it even further and snort it directly. Mm -hmm. Some people are just that bad to the bone, I guess. But most of the time, they drop it in one of those pipes or a glass tube um, and and melt it down until it's a gas form. But uh, that's more of a pure. That's a one. That's probably some of the purest because it's crystal clear. That's why it's called ice crystal crystal meth. That's exactly what it looks like. Now that is a lot of times calling cards. Um, since the TV show Breaking Bad came out, you're going to start seeing a lot more little. We started seeing a lot more nuances of different colors. If they get their calling card in that show, his was had a little red tint to it because he put chili powder in it. I, there's no rhyme or reason to it, but um, methamphetamine from Afghanistan is going to look like that. Okay, there's cocaine, white powder. Can you identify that as cocaine just by looking at it? No. <clears throat> Been doing this for 17 years and every bit of cocaine looks just like baby powder or baking soda or corn starch or whatever. But if, when I describe it, it's a white, in my report, it's a white powdery substance. But it can also be uh, cooked into a rock, crack rock. And, you know, here's something gross. You know, a lot of guys that sell crack, you know, crack is still a thing. Uh, crack is not water soluble. So guess where they, they keep it when they're out on the street selling it? Oh no. no. You want to go buy a rock sometimes? If you see them, it's so gross. No. But it doesn't, your 
saliva doesn't break it down. You got to smoke it. Heroin? Well, that just looks kind of like brown sugar and baking powder. There's your heroin from Afghanistan. A little different. And the texture of the fracking is that sweet? I don't know. But that's probably from Mexico. That's Afghanistan. That's black tar heroin. And black tar, it is that goopy and sticky. You can melt it down, and a lot of times they'll inject it. Okay. If you want to take a picture of that screen, or if you want to stick around afterwards, uh, you can. Uh, those are some of the papers that, uh, that's one of 27,000 thousand papers about some of this stuff. But it is, uh, it was very, it was a whole lot more in depth. Here we've blown through an hour and 35, 37 minutes, and that's just scratching the, but hopefully uh, it will be, uh, keep your phones out because there's another slide or two of, of those. Um, everybody ready for the next one? There's the next one. I did that just like a paper. They're in alphabetical order, at least in tries. You do not get them out of out, out in alphabetical order. <laughs> Dr. Scott jump all over us. <laughs> Big red circle. But there's, <laughs> all right, y'all got that one? All right, I'll take this the last one. Uh, one of them was in Russian, but they conveniently translated it for me. That was awful nice of them. But uh, this is, again, a drop in 27,000 documents. Uh, the information's out there. Uh, you have access to every bit of this because this came straight out of uh, UT's library access. Uh, and uh, ultimately, just like with neurolinguistics and anything else we do, uh, when we want to say, oh, I think somebody's doing this. We don't just go with a, a, a gut feeling. Just one or two of these things is not going to be enough to really say, I probably need to tell somebody about this. It's when you start seeing more and more and more and seeing over and over and over again. Same with the behaviors and the signs. They don't always mean drug use. David Bowie. Uh, we had a guy when I was in police academy, we were doing, learn, doing our SFST certifications. He had a natural nystagmus to his eyes, didn't have a drop of alcohol. And when he blew into the breathalyzer, it was 0, 0.0. And every one of us missed that. Wow. Now, most people with those conditions are gonna tell you, especially if you ask questions and they know that you're poking around. They're like, ah, I know what you're getting at. Uh, we're looking again at things that are missing and out of place. Okay? That's, that's a, the biggest thing you can take away from anything that is when you're dealing with it. Like, are they actually doing this? Is this a, when you see that child displaying the, you know, those things that we talked about, or an adult, or whatever, that's something. That's not supposed. Something's up there, and it may be enough to just go to Mary Jane and say, "Hey, kind of started noticing some things. We're at least we're aware of it. We can then see if there's anything further." When you start seeing patterns and things that are concerning about the things that you see here, and things that you learn, just kind of continuing do, digging into it a little further. That's when you reach out and call somebody. I'm pretty sure just reaching out to Mary Jo would be like, hey, this is kind of what I'm let her handle that. I don't know what you're probably. Well, I was going to put Nicole on the spot and say, hey, supervisor, what would you like to volunteer advocates to do? And you saw mm -hmm. it's a place that you know, Oh, it's definitely reported to CPS. And then they would hope and then and call in and say, if we were 100% sure, don't you know, let the investigators handle it. We've made more. Hotline in the last six months that I've seen in And what what has what has happened in the last six months to a year that stresses people out more than anything in any family situation? Price of food, clothing, and shelter has pretty much doubled in the last couple of years, and now we're starting to see the response of that in thefts, drug use, and other criminal activities and behaviors and negative behaviors. Yes, sir. I'm just curious now that you know all over Texas you see these stores now that are selling you know Kratom and Delta Eight and all these things and so on. My understanding is a THC in the form of you know Delta Eight is it's essentially the same thing and the same experience, but it's just a yeah. chemically complex they change the molecule one they can change one molecule and say that is not meth. That is this. Yeah. This is the meth molecule, this is the Kratom. Outlaw that, they'll 
it's 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 it, all it is is a cat and mouse game and it's not going anywhere okay there's like what are you saying the war on drugs is a losing battle um yeah it's not going anywhere um people say well this is just something new i said like, why do you think there's vfws when did vfws start in world war ii is there anything wrong with the vfw no why did they get created because we didn't understand what post-traumatic distress disorder was and People were going to the bars and self-medicating. Some people were better at it than others. So we can say, we can go back in all of history. You can go back to the first century, and why does the Apostle Paul say, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with oil? Because people were self-medicating back then. This is nothing new, and it's not going anywhere. However, we do know and understand the consequences a lot more as we get smarter and we get more information, and we become more aware, okay? Do you know what happened when the CAC ramped up their, uh, the Children's Advocacy Center ramped up their uh, in-school education? The reporting matched the amount of education. Well, did those other cases just all of a sudden occur? No. The kids didn't know any better. So you have an employee that's going into somebody's house and they, they all this stuff is here and you don't recognize it. And you don't say, wasn't that it wasn't there. Why did you start using meth? I've been using meth for 20 years. You just didn't see it. It's not that it's not there. It's just that sometimes more, we, we just, we don't know what to look for. We don't know what's supposed to be there, not supposed to be there. And this is again, just a drop in the bucket, but when we start seeing things that, why is that there? And you know those things in the back of your mind, that subconscious pull, there's like something was off about that. Maybe something you saw and heard in this crazy guy named Tim's seminar, or, 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 something is telling you this is your limbic system is trying to protect you. And people that like myself, you guys that like to serve and do things, that pours out even to protect those that were with okay um a yes you know, if, if a person is you know as a pastor i'm using her and mm -hmm. you know primarily given marijuana mm -hmm. well if they switch to these variants mm -hmm. like uh, delta eight right and will those pop on a test and other i don't know that i don't know so you may be so if you know that mom or dad is you know they're taking these gummies Mm -hmm. and they are high. I mean, they may be within the right. It's fully legal, and it's Delta 8, right? I mean, that's... Could be. Uh, again, that's that's where just because it's illegal to have doesn't necessarily mean it's Ill It's not illegal to consume because alcohol is, is legal to consume, but we have laws in place that it doesn't matter what the substance is, you can still be charged with driving while intoxicated. Smith County has trained, I think we have four or five um, uh, drug recognition experts on our patrol vision. I think each shift has a DRE is what they're called. They are a certified expert and can testify to reading these, a lot of these, there's, there's pages of things that they have to learn how to recognize. Uh, these are some of the common scratch in the surface, but they, there's ways. And the reason is, is because you don't have to, you can be intoxicated on milk. Wait, what? If you consume any substance that impairs your ability to drive, then that you can be charged with driving while intoxicated. Now, that's obviously a very extreme. You know, I'm not going to charge anybody for driving while intoxicated. On, but if if you do something and you're intentionally getting drunk or getting high and then operating a motor vehicle there we have things in place it doesn't matter what it is if we stop you because you couldn't uh, you fail to maintain a single lane of traffic or you didn't signal or whatever and we get up there and we suspect that you are intoxicated we can take you in, into custody under that uh, uh, probable cause and we can then get a warrant for your blood and it doesn't we're not looking for anything necessarily specific. We're looking at something that can make you become intoxicated. It doesn't matter if it's Kratom. It doesn't matter if it's beer. It doesn't matter if it's whiskey, weed, heroin, whatever. Okay. Um, you know, when we're, somebody's lethargic they, and they, when they don't, and they don't smell alcohol, they could have taken barbiturates or some downer. It's going to make you, uh, okay. 
If you take methamphetamine, guess what? You're going to be hyper. It's a stimulant. You might know the, the most commonly abused stimulant in the country? Coffee. Caffeine. It's a stimulant. You're like, yes, I love it. You know, so when things are in excess, those are indicators for us that there may be intoxication of some kind. We call our DRE and say, hey, check this person out. Awesome. Or, in fact, we draw blood. Good question. Very good question. I know y'all got some questions. Anybody online has got some questions? Yes, it look like it at the moment. Boo. Just kidding, guys, online. <laughs> Love you. I'm glad you're I'm glad you're still with us. Thank Anybody you so else? Much. Okay. Awesome. Yes, ma'am. See any of the um the gummies or whatever in the uh, schools lately? No, oh, well, they're all over the place. Yes. Uh, our our school resource officers constantly run into that. Yeah, you've got a lot of people just transport them. You can go up to Colorado, yeah. and a lot of people buy stuff up there because they're a little less. We don't care. They're a little more. We don't care. And so, yeah. Well, guys, y'all have been wonderful. I uh, hope that you took something from that. And are you, do you have anything? I'm turn it back over. Hunting. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah, really, thank you so that much. Was great. Yeah. yeah. I like pictures too. Yeah, that was, that was really helpful. Um, before y'all leave, you wouldn't mind just dropping off your survey with Miss Stephanie. And if you're joining us via Zoom, if you would just put a one to five in the chat um, on how applicable this was for your. Uh, Did I just cut them off? Screen uh, sharing. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, you stop it. You're good. Thanks, sir. No, you're good. You're good. Oh, then we appreciate it. Delete that off of the. Uh, oh, <laughs> it's not taking up your hard drive space. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, no